And now, uh, Dr. Green, uh, it's your turn. And uh, I think we go away a little bit from, from, from numbers. Um, you are uh, dealing more with uh, arguments and words, opinions, and all this stuff. So we are very interested to see how the qualitative aspects can be uh, captured in this approach. Please. Lovely. Thank you. Anyway, so thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, Odeal, amazing. It was really, I might use some of yours in my uh, Climate Change HIA report. Um, but this is basically, this. my presentation is, I'm going to tell you about an actual health impact assessment that we have carried out uh, in mm -hmm. Wales on uh, the health impacts of climate change. Um, who is going to be affected? How they're going to be affected? And as Adil said, you can uh, mitigate uh, for some of these positive and negative uh, impacts, maximise the positives or any opportunities and mitigate any negatives uh, and make some sort of suggested actions and recommendations, which is part of the HIA process. Um, I want to say thank you to Neris, uh, who works with me and my team. Um, it was a bit of a joint effort and we're still in the final stages, which I'll discuss. But a lot of this is going to build on Odile's presentation and talk a lot about um, actually the stakeholder participation and what we've been told uh, from a wide range of people and bodies and organisations in Wales. So Wales uh, is, is small compared to North Rhine Westphalia and India um, and it is devolved so it has the ability to make its own bills and acts and legislate for health and social care. It can also legislate uh, for um, the environment and make regulations around spatial planning, land use planning, transport, all these kind of things that can fill, feel, filter into climate change or where climate change is relevant. Wales has about three million people, just over three million. So it is tiny compared to you guys. Um, and it's predominantly rural with just a couple of cities, uh, mainly in the south. Um, but the Welsh Government has always had a very clear focus on sustainable development. It has this uh, act called the Wellbeing of the Future Generations Act. Um, and actually the sustainable development goals are built into that. So it's the first, first country in the world to actually legislate in a way for the sustainable development goals. And it, it makes public bodies in Wales such as Welsh Government or the Public Health Wales Institute that I, I work for or uh, the Environment Agency for Wales and Natural Resources Wales, their public bodies, local governments, health boards, actually they have to consider what their, what they do now and how that will have an impact on future generations um, and what would that look like so that they can try and mitigate for it so that they don't do things that may damage uh, the environment or people's health and well-being in the future. Um, Wales also declared a climate emergency um, and um, that that was a big change uh, for, for Wales um, and many other nations have done this and, and followed. And some of this is around the increased incidence of heat but also the increased incidence of uh, storms and flooding in Wales uh, and they have been badly affected in Wales the last couple of years. So why did we do a HIA? It's been recommended by a number of uh, scientific advisory bodies. Uh, health and wellbeing has been referenced by the uh, Intergovernment Panel for Climate Change. And they say that actually mitigations for climate change could provide significant opportunities for health but it could also widen inequalities. And that's something that we've looked at as well, um, particularly in the short to medium to the long term. Um, so what might be good for the environment might not be bad for health, might be bad for health, and what might be good for health might be bad for the environment or the economy or whatever. So we wanted to kind of unpick this. And building on the HIA of Brexit that we did, um, Public Health Wales Board, felt that actually this is an opportunity for us to really consider how um, health and well-being impacts could play out uh, in the future and now due to climate change in Wales. Um, and HIA therefore is felt, was felt to be a really great tool. 
we've got a small unit, which I'm director of, the Wales HIA support unit. Um, and so we've got a lot of experience in this area and we've used it. And so our board wanted us to do this to help inform them for their plans and but also for other public bodies so that they could help meet that requirement under the Wellbeing of the Future Generations Act. So the aims of the uh, HIA that we carried out, so basic to just identify the potential health and wellbeing impacts of climate change, um, whether they be physical or mental or social or economic or environmental. So those wider determinants of health, but also a deal reference the distribution uh, of the uh, impacts. So who is going to be affected and actually what does that mean? So it might mean one thing to you and it might affect your health and well-being in one way, but it might affect mine or Adele's or Helmut's in a different way. So how would that affect your working life, your leisure, your the, the whole social sort of and environmental um, aspects? So we really wanted to unpick that. And while we got have got a lot of evidence and we ha I'll talk to you about that in a minute through a literature review, a systematic literature review, uh, some of which included stats like those referenced by your deal. We really wanted to talk to the stakeholders in Wales, the organisations, the bodies and the people um, to find out exactly well, what does it mean? What does it mean to you? How will it ha affect your health and wellbeing? And we wanted to provide some evidence, therefore, to try and um, support policies and plans and projects going forward, but also that actually we really should be thinking about integrating health and wellbeing into adaptation plans and policy making for the future, um, because we will have to transition and what will that make, look like? Um, so it's actually been sort of carried out prior to the pandemic. Um, but some of this work has been used already to inform Public Health Wales work programme and some of Welsh Government's work, and I can talk about that later. So what did the HIA look like? So Adil talked about the different processes, um, but it can also be at different scales and scope. So this looked at Wales only. It's comprehensive, so it looked at both the uh, evidence that you can get from systematic reviews, but it, it was participatory. We talked to many work uh, stakeholders in workshops and interviews, um, and it looked at the potential as well as some of the actual impacts. What do we actually know? What's confirmed already? Like I say, it was disrupted due to the pandemic because we're part of a public health institute. Therefore, we were all diverted onto COVID. Uh, and the acute response, but I also carried out some health impact assessments on some of the measures such as Helmut referred to, like the lockdowns or home working, uh, the impact on housing of uh, COVID response measures. So HIA looks at both positive and negative impacts, um, and it also looks for opportunities for the future. And that can be really helpful to inform people and make them think, well, actually, if I carry out a HIA of my plan or my policy, it's going to make me look really bad because it's just going to talk about negative impacts. But actually, we've unpicked quite a few opportunities and potential positive impacts from this work. Um, looked across the determinants of health, looked at inequalities. And HIA is open, transparent, uh, as a deal reference, but it's also very much grounded in evidence. So. The, the literature review, the interviews, the workshops, but we also did commission two case studies which were presented at the stakeholder workshops as well. And we asked people to look at them and talk about them as well. Um, we needed governance, so we established a strategic advisory group and that included some of the key actual decision makers in Wales. So the Welsh Government, NRW, the Environment Agency, Public Health Wales, health boards, but also academics from Cardiff University or Aberystwyth University. Uh, the HIA report is not published yet. We're in the process of finalising it. Um, but we did want to make the most of the opportunity to highlight the health and wellbeing impacts um, of climate change for COP26. Uh, at the end of last year and we produced some infographics and I'll show you those at the end. 
So this is the process to date. So the screening, the scoping, the who, the how, what do we look at, what evidence do we collect, which we then collected, and we're at the reporting and recommendation stage. And then at the end, we talked about monitoring and evaluation, and we'll review and reflect actually how was the process, but in the future, can we track what we predicted or what we thought, will that actually match what could happen? And we're just finishing that with the HA of the lockdown, actually. And we can see that actually a lot of what we predicted was correct. So this is a list of all the evidence. The picture that you see there is of uh, South Wales. Uh, when it was flooded in early 2020. So you can see that actually climate change, lots of people think of it, it's in the future, but actually it's now, it's an immediate problem and we really need to do something about it. And hence we gathered all the information we could and we've triangulated it, we've synthesised it and we've analysed it and we've come up with um, some idea of those who are going to be particularly affected how they're going to be affected and where they might be and what kind of settings uh, and geog geographical locations. So that's so far. OK, thank you very much for this overview. So a little bit different approach. And uh, you have a very long list of uh, stakeholders to be involved. Could this be a kind of blueprint? Uh, We'll frame it the question a different way. Uh, have you overlooked one important stakeholder? Uh, no, I don't think so, because we we've invited so many. We have talked to so many people. Um, um, and all we can do is is try and connect with people. But looking at our long lists, we have pretty much got everybody oh. that we need to talk to. Um, and also any, anything that we potentially thought was um, missing, we actually snowballed and looked for. Mm. And I get some questions in here where pe people are getting impatient. They want to know uh, the results of your health impact assessment of the Brexit. Oh, right. OK. Can you so, in, in one minute, in one minute, the results? OK, mm -hmm. overwhelmingly negative, but uh, actually there were some positive, potential positive impacts that are possible, um, particularly around Wales's ability as a devolved nation to respond. So things like uh, the environment um, regulations could be strengthened, but also they could they could decline. Um, the fact that it will have Brexit will have an impact on employment, um, but actually it gives Wales an opportunity to rethink sort of some of their agricultural models because they're big recipients of, well, of European funding for agriculture. Um, but actually one of the strange impacts that we predicted was we will no longer be part of the European Medicines Agency. But actually, which we thought in we the evidence suggested was going to be very bad. But what we've seen under COVID was actually it gave Wales and the UK the ability to regulate for vaccines for COVID much more quickly than on the continent. So that was a really interesting. That was a really interesting yeah. find. Yeah. That's just okay. a quick snapshot. Okay, good. Now we had a break, and now we dive back into climate change and health and for you the second part please thank you but actually brexit does relate relate to some of this as does COVID. so okay so in order to um scope who we wanted to talk to we came up with a long a long list and also we came up with a a stakeholder evidence plan so we sat down and we talked about how we were going to engage with people and the types of ways we were going to do it because as you you know we've just talked about there's a long list of people that actually we needed to talk to at a variety of different levels so some are more at the higher level of well of government of public bodies um national organizations 
um, and some of those are actually about the local level impacts, so a community level, an operational level. So some of it could be like Public Health Wales or the Health and Social Care Departments of Welsh Government, but also in terms of health or social care, we would need to talk to the local health boards or the local authorities who actually deliver those services in respect to health and social care. So the way we did it was we decided that in order not to uh, confuse the issues was just to have two workshops that focused on these different levels. And then we identified exactly uh, who needed to come at that level and um, and to invite them and talk to them. So um, the second workshop was very interesting because that was more about how would the impacts, what did they mean at a local level on the actual population? Um, so, it, you know, how people have been affected by those flooding events, how they have been affected in their settings or within their organisations or at a local community level by flooding, by extreme heat events that have been becoming more frequent in Wales. Uh, and then the interviews, we actually went more to those who are specifically experts in their field. So some may be, you know, climate change and travel, active transport. Some of them might be more about, well, the sociological level. Some might be more at the environmental uh, risk factor uh, level. So we had a very long list of those as well. And then we um, we did these two case studies, one of which is a, a, a short rapid HIA and one which actually goes went and talked to the community of Fairbourne in 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 North Wales, um, which is a local authority area of Gwynedd, and that will be the first community in in Wales in the UK that will be reclaimed by the sea. So you know how they're being directly affected and what's happening on the ground there about how do they mitigate for that because that is going to happen within the next 30 to 40 years. Um, so the workshops, so the strategic perspective, the policy uh, perspective, we had 17 representatives. There's a list there of people who came um, and then the organisation on community insights. Again, it was sort of you'll see some of those same sort of um, organisations, so from housing, from transport, sustainability, public health at a local level, but also people who are going to build houses, those in schools, uh, community and voluntary organisations, because often they're the ones that come in to help and support communities when they're flooded, when they're cut off, when they, they have extreme snow. Um, farmers who are going to be severely affected or, at an agricultural and economic level, um, carers, because they're, they're the people who have to make sure that um, they, 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 their services still run and mental health charities, because part of our screening actually identified that mental health is and the health impacts of climate change will affect people's he mental health and well-being in, in, in potentially a very negative way. So we engage with also older people and younger people, bearing in mind the um, Future Generations Act and asking young people, well, what do you think, what would you like to see in the future to mitigate this? And then there's a list of all the uh, those that we sort of interviewed. And again, you might think, well, actually, that's duplication. But these were more very specialist and, um, you know, they have a deep, deep insight into a lot of these issues. Um, so climate change has become a very hot topic, um, excuse the pun, um, across across Wales as it is across the world, and that was reflected in, in COP. Um, but there's been quite a big mobilisation amongst young people in Wales uh, about climate change and really, um, you know, a lot of stress and anxiety and worry. Uh, but also we need to think about things like, well, how will climate change affect them in the future and are there any co-benefits? Um, and I think it's worthwhile pointing out that actually 
there could be a lot of co-benefits in addressing climate change and you might want to actually make the most of that and I don't think people are connecting those dots together sometimes uh, and actually you know everybody can think well you know it's going to be very doom and gloom but actually if it's done in a very sensitive way it can reap co-benefits for both health the environment the economy and the climate so the key themes that came out of our workshops and our interviews so this is the qualitative data um so again it was about talking to young people how it affected them what's going to happen in future generations um and very much this sort of disconnect from some stakeholders that well actually climate change is in the future it's not going to you know, it's not actually a big concern for me now. I've still got to deliver my health services. I've still got to deliver my social services. So I can't stop and think about what's going to happen in the future and how it's going to affect young people. Whereas young people are getting very anxious and saying, you're going, you're wasting resources. You really need to think about it now because, you know, what am I going to be left with? What is my family going to be left with? And that was very clear and that came through quite, uh, quite, quite strongly. Uh, the impact on those on low incomes, because in Wales there is a large body uh, of the employee workforce who don't earn high wages, um, and the impacts of of climate change and transitioning through to meet climate targets um, or any sort of um, uh, things that would benefit the climate and the environment going forward could have detrimental impacts on people's income and their employment. And that would primarily or could primarily affect those on low incomes, things like inflation or increased energy prices or include in increased fuel costs. Um, I mean, food costs. If you're on a low income, then that's quite a large point part of your disposable income so it could squeeze it in other ways and you know you could lead to end up in food poverty and fuel poverty mental health and well-being came through immense not just the stress of thinking about the future and what might happen but actually the stress and anxiety of when people have been flooded and you know we have got evidence around post-traumatic stress disorder um, and the fact that you know, mental health and well-being is also composed of people's resilience and the resilience of communities to um, to have the infrastructure and the confidence and support that if there was an extreme storm, they would be protected, they wouldn't suffer. So that came through very strongly. Infrastructure, roads, railways, quite self-explanatory. Um, flooding and flood risks came through very clearly but also we're seeing increased extreme heat events in Wales and I don't really think that's been sort of um, articulated quite clearly um, that actually we are getting um, a hot, hotter summers, um, we're getting wetter winters and so what would that look like for Wales because heat risks in things like care homes, heat risks in schools, how you know we're not set up for hot very hot days in school playgrounds with shade for children when they're out playing so how do we think about that and the other thing that came through quite clearly in the um workshops was this talk about skills uh, needed to be sustainable so people tend to buy new things they don't repair things they throw things away and there's a loss of skills around things like you know sewing or you know repairing things and that that was really big big thing along with the impacts economically because we might have to suffer there could be negative short term to medium term negative impacts in transitioning but you would need to go through that in order to reap the potential positive longer term benefits so there's this sort of tension between that and obviously how we communicate it and very much that climate change and the way it affects us is here and now and not something in the future so we talked about also exactly how this the determinants of a of health and well-being, the social determinants would be affected. And this is a list. So I won't go through them all, but I mentioned food and nutrition. So food security. So for example, 
climate change, extreme weather events, a tsunami can disrupt transport and travel lines, supply lines. You know, we import a lot of things and export a lot of things to ensure that we have the lifestyles we have now. We, you know, we import mangoes, we import bananas into Wales, we export lamb, we export things. And so climate change can disrupt that. Um, so at a very basic level, it can dis disrupt supply chains. But also Wales has a very agrarian, rural, large farming community uh, that produces, you know, lamb and wool. Um, and so, you know, climate change is actually going to physically affect uh, food security in Wales through its production of, of its its food, some of its food. And then that could have a resultant effect on farmers and their livelihoods and could lead to, you know, aspects of poverty or fuel poverty or food poverty. So and then another thing to pick up is the um, sort of social and community factors. So the community resilience and cohesion, you know, people we know when we've had extreme weather events, that communities have come together, they've supported each other, and it can form and foster closer community uh, cohesiveness and relationships. But also climate change could lead to displacements of communities such as Fairbourne, which is basically going to fall into the sea. And then I reference settings as well. So we know workplaces are going to be affected, so extreme heat, Aircon, we're going to need that. We're going to, have to think about how sustainable that is, how sustainable our buildings are. Again, hospitals, care homes, prisons, how do they react and adapt to these kind of different impacts? Um, the population groups affected, I've referenced some of these, those on health conditions or those with disabilities, again, because they could be in, in care homes or hospitals or need to use services or be provided with services in their own homes. So how would climate change affect that if you're being cared for and your carer can't get to you? Um, occupational groups like farmers, fishers, although we don't have a, very many fishermen uh, as, a, as a, uh, an economic group in Wales, coastal flood areas because areas are being more frequently flooded around the coast um, and you know population groups affected could mean that not only do we have internal displacement but we could receive more climate refugees into Wales and the UK and that but there we also realized that there are some contextual factors and mediators that we needed to think through. So how did democracy and decision making come into this? How do people's perceptions of risk and, um, you know, as in, well, it's just this, I'm not doing the, the climate much harm, could be actually somebody else was, yes, you are. You know, so we're seeing big shifts in the way people are eating and becoming more vegetarian and vegan and eating less food. Um, that is you know intensive and and harmful to the environment so what did we find before i go into this did you want to ask any questions i've only got a few slides yeah but just please go on just please go on. okay cool so um what have we found so there's a wide range of probable impacts because we can't say with any certainty some of these future impacts are going to happen. Um, and a lot of them will affect the whole population of Wales. So employment, the economy, food security, like I've uh, talked about. Um, but there's a, a wide range of potential population groups, occupations and settings like the farmers, children and young people, schools care homes, prisons, those kind of settings. Um, and there will be moderate to major negative impacts in the short and long term. So we know that uh, around the environment, the economy, health behaviours. But there could also be moderate to major opportunities. Um, so the major is really significant opportunities in the long term. 
but that actually depends on the policy direction now. So if we make changes and adapt some of our policies so that we become a low carbon economy, which we have a decarbonisation plan uh, for Wales, for the NHS, for public bodies, but that shift could have some short term negative impacts. So it's how do we manage that? And that is all very that's got to come on the policies and the plans and the projects that actually happen. So there is a lot of policy dialogue going on, but actually it's got to be solidified and something like this HIA will help inform people and help inform their thinking. Uh, mental wellbeing impact, a lot of that is due to stress, anxiety, uncertainty. The economic impacts will also bring stress, anxiety, uncertainty. Um, the importance of thinking through health integration into these strategic policies and plans is, is coming through very clear. Um, and I think that was reflected in some of COP too, where there was more discussion around the health and wellbeing impacts and the equity impacts of the who's going to be affected. And talking about the who, that sort of intergenerational justice element of, of our older people, they've exhausted some of these in not finite resources. Well, what are we going to be left with as children, as young people for the future? Um, and this sort of very different sort of frame of thinking um, about about climate change and the environment um, between generations. And, you know, we've also seen very different patterns in other big topics in Wales. So, for example, for Brexit, younger people tended to vote to remain in the European Union, whereas many older people voted to withdraw and leave the European Union. And we can see that very clearly in voting patterns there. And we're sort of seeing this same thing play out around climate change. And talking of Brexit and COVID, Wales and the UK has also got to think of the triple challenge, which I've also been working on, which is, you know, the health and wellbeing impacts of Brexit and COVID and climate change are all happening together now. So what does that mean as a cumulative way? Uh, and what can we do to think about that? And what are the impacts? Who's going to be affected? And I've produced a series of papers on that, about looking exactly at that. Um, I talked about the infographics um, and these are a couple. So we produced these for COP in November. They've been very well received and quite graphically um, explain what we're finding in our HIA. Uh, these are available online. They're on a website now or I can send them to you. That's no problem at all. Um, but they, there's a series of four and these are just two of them. So in conclusion, there was quite a lot of benefits and challenges to carrying out the HIA. The engagement of the stakeholders and the quality of ev evidence was really, really helpful, was really positive, was really it made people think, it engaged with those who are directly making the plans and directly coming up with the policies in Welsh Government or Public Health Wales or the Environment Agency uh, and health boards. Um, it's a really great advocacy tool to sort of support health and wellbeing advocacy and that health in all policies, that actually health and wellbeing is integral to climate change and vice versa. Um, but also we've taken a lot of evidence and identified some gaps in it as well. So there's some gaps in the research um, which we may need to think about uh, going forward um, because there's an awful lot around agriculture, there's an awful lot around some, some, some around mental well-being and mental health, but actually do we need to expand on that and then use that going forward. Um, the challenges, I have to say it was it's hugely com complex. Um, the evidence base is always evolving. We've seen many different, you know, this was started prior to the pandemic. We tried to update it um, as much as we can. Um, and, it is, you know, there's an awful lot of impacts across the determinants of health and population groups. So it's how we articulate that as well. And that's a big challenge going forward. 
this is where we are. So I'm right in the report. Hopefully we'll have it out by the summer. Um, we will be publishing the case study separately in the interim. And also we're looking at how we can build on this HIA to come up with a practical toolkit for public health teams and bodies to think about, well, what are the health impacts of their climate change adaptation plans going forward? <laughs>